Hi guys. I do not have any way of knowing whether my head is being cut off right now or not. Uh, <laughs> oh well. It really isn't important if my head is cut off or not, I guess. But it is a lovely winter night here. Somewhere outside of the... Uh, Paradise of Inverness, Florida. It is Tuesday night, February 4th, 2020, and I know there's something going on right now at this moment here on Tuesday night, February 4th, 2020, that I'm supposed to be listening to or attending to, but I just can't quite think what it is, so uh, instead what I will do with myself is uh, do what I do every day or now since I am so busy all day every day with getting my little bivouac for the collapse of global industrial civilization. I will do it at night and that is bringing you today's or tonight's Chronicle of the Collapse. And this is Sam Mitchell. And you have found Chronicles, you have found the Collapse Chronicles. This is my little sidekick, Sancho Panza. And before I, I dive into uh, the today's or tonight's Chronicle of the Collapse, big, uh, big thank you, a huge thank you. To Brother Dennis, to kind-hearted listener Brother Dennis for his very kind donation to my PayPal account to uh, support my work on YouTube. And uh, to anybody who has ever supported whatever it is that I do on YouTube, uh, I really do, really do appreciate it. And I also appreciate everyone who has uh, who sends me all of these various chronicles of the collapse. And I want to send a big thank you out to someone I a man I have interviewed here before. That is K Dog, brother K Dog, sometimes known as Keith Hayes. And Keith Hayes, he has sent me a 510 page book. 510 pages. We're not going to sit here and read 510 pages. I will put the link on here to, and this is, that this fellow uh, must have spent a year of his life, and little dog, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go find somewhere else to sit. This is from the Geological Survey of Finland from a fellow by uh, the name of Simon Michaud, I guess, M-I-C-H-A-U-X. I got a little slap on the wrist from one of my listeners about over there in Europe about how Americans do not know how to pronounce people's names. No, it's just that Europeans don't know how to spell names that Americans can pronounce. M-I-C-H-A-U-X. Simon Michaud, I'm going to call him. And anyway, what is on Simon's 510-page mind today is oil from a critical raw material perspective. We had, good Lord, Simon is, this man has done his homework. 500 and 10 pages of explanation basically about why the the very thought of global industrial society getting off of fossil fuels is an absolute joke. It is not going to happen that we are going to go right on uh, with business as usual in our fossil fuel to global industrial civilization. I mean, this man, uh, he has charts, he has graphs, he has diagrams, he has pictures, 
He has links to dozens, if not hundreds, of other studies. Just the appendix, the appendices go on probably for 50 pages. But anyway, we're simply going to read the introduction to uh, basically why global industrial civilization is going to collapse. Take it away, Simon. <clears throat> Today, approximately 90% of the supply chain of all, otherwise known as every industrially manufactured products, depend on the availability of oil-derived products or oil-delivered services, or combination of the two. Oil is not only the source material for producing fuels and lubricants, but is also used as hydrocarbon for most organic polymers. Can you say plastic? That's what he's talking about here. Currently, substitution materials for plastics like hemp is not accepted by the current plastics industry and considered not economically viable. It is therefore one of the most raw materials, not hemp, oil. It is therefore, oil is therefore one of the most important uh, raw materials, I would say the most important raw material in the production of many different products such as pharmaceuticals, dyes, and textiles. As the source material for various types of fuels, oil is a basic prerequisite for the transportation of large quantities of goods over long distances. Yeah, like 98% I would guess. Oil alongside information technology, container ships, trucks, and aircraft form the backbone of globalization and our current industrial ecosystem. International Division of Labor, to which many countries owe their wealth, would not be possible without today's volume of cost-efficient goods transport. Oil-based mobility also significantly influences our lifestyles, do you think so, both regionally and locally. For example, living in the suburbs several kilometers away from their workplace would be impossible for many people without a car. To a certain extent, the classical suburb thus also owes its existence to oil. And James Howard Kunstler, of course, has made a major focus of his work talking about the end of suburbia. Although here in Inverness, Florida is a perfect example. It's, it's Inverness, Florida in Citrus County, Florida, all it is is suburbs. I guess it's suburbs of suburbs, you know, from the Tampa Bay Urban Center mostly. Anyway, a considerable increase in the price of oil would pose a systemic risk because the availability of relatively affordable oil is crucial for the functioning of large parts of the economic and social systems. For some subsystems, such as worldwide shipping or individual transportation, the importance of oil is obvious. The systemic relevance and strategic significance that is ascribed to oil and in particular and to secure energy supplies in general is also reflected in various strategic documents 
of state and international organizations, the international community as well as every single country therefore has a vital interest in secure oil supplies. A global lack of oil could represent a systemic risk because its versatility as a source of energy and as a chemical raw material would mean that virtually every social subsystem would be affected by a shortage. The purpose of this report is to address the current dependency on oil, the industrial impl implications of a possible supply shortfall and an assessment of how far away a supply to demand gap could be. This is done in a global context as energy is an international industrial ecosystem. This study also will consider the implications for Europe. Uh, you know, kind of, I don't, this is, this is from Finland, remember. Okay, in 2019, this was written in the last week of 2019, so I guess we can change this to in 2020. In 2020, there is a widely supported push to transform our industrial system into a non-fossil fuel, preferably renewable supported system. To do this, oil and petroleum-based technology is to be phased out. This is often referred to as the electric vehicle revolution. In studying this task, the mineral requirements for industrial supply to construct and manage the new power system is of strategic interest at the uh, Swedish uh, the Geological Survey of Finland. What is also useful to understand is what time frame the new system is required to be commissioned. One of the strategic restraints for the time frame is the understanding of the existing system of fossil fuels, in this case oil. How reliable is the current oil supply system? How long will it remain to be so? Okay, that is the end of the uh, introduction, but we're just going to read, uh, just to give you some idea, we're just going to plow in and read chapter one. Energy is the master resource. Energy is the master resource. It allows and facilitates all physical work done, the development of technology, and allows human populations to live in such high-density settlements like modern cities. Currently, the majority of our society's energy comes from fossil fuel sources. The renewable energy sources like solar, wind, and hydro have been shown to be stable from an engineering context and are being implemented at an increasing rate. Whether these renewable systems will be available to all sections of society in the same quantities as the existing system remains to be seen. And, uh, of course, I've had many people on here uh, that I've already interviewed uh, who have pointed out that no, they don't. Uh, that there's, we have already seen uh, that all that these renewable energy systems are doing is adding to 
oil and fossil fuels that the demand for fossil fuels is staying constant and even rising even if and as renewable energy becomes a larger proportion of the mix if the entire ball of wax is getting bigger as energy demand meaning fossil and uh, renewable energy if the whole balloon of energy demand is expanding and expanding and expanding you see how the balloon of fossil fuel demand uh, is, is not going down it, it, it's at best staying fairly stable at what are we 100 million barrels per day which we hit for the first time about a year ago where was I back to Simon energy consumption correlates directly with the real economy the real economy is the that part of the economy that is concerned with actually producing goods and services as to as opposed to the part of the economy that is concerned with buying and selling on the financial markets yes the real economy the movement of goods and services future projections of global energy demand are usually developed on past behavior with no understanding of finite limits or depleting resources generally reserves have been projected on by past production and demand has been defined by population growth and economic GDP the modern world is heavily interdependent do you think so many of the structures and institutions we now depend upon function in a global context energy as a fundamental resource underpins the global industrial system and one of the people he quotes here is Charles Hall because he links you into all of these uh, other studies and I just had the pleasure of interviewing Charles Hall uh, I'll be running that interview in a couple of weeks and Charles Hall is going to be expanding on a lot of this, what we're talking about here. Figures 3 and 4 show that global crude oil production is related to global GDP and global human population, but they are not direct correlations. Well, I would again I am not uh, you know I am just someone with a brain who can read hockey sticks and when you put global population next to fossil fuels uh, you know right about the time that fossil fuels uh, hit the global market how the global population shot up like a hockey stick I think they are directly correlated, but Simon, I guess, does not believe they are directly correlated. The relationships are event and era based, where events over time create different conditions of influence. This report will discuss what each of the turning point dates shown might mean and then good lord does he go through the charts and graphs uh, I mean unbelievable this man has done his homework uh, all this highlights the challenge of maintaining long-term economic security in context that not all nations have the same requirement 
American society consumes petroleum products at a rate of three and a half gallons of oil and more than 250 cubic feet of natural gas per day each. Every American uh, averaged out uses three and a half gallons of oil and more than 250 cubic feet of natural gas per day. Uh, but petroleum is not just used for fuel. Ever since the Industrial Revolution started in the 18th century, vast quantities of fossil fuels have been used to power the economy and deliver unprecedented affluence for large numbers of people, also known as consumers. Energy for the modern industrial world is generated from many sources. The use of fossil fuels has been increasing in step with economic growth. Fossil fuels were prerequisites for the birth of a new industrial civilization that transformed our world. Technology is made possible with the quality and quantity of available energy. Energy has been the fundamental facilitator in the application of technology seen as industrial revolutions. The first industrial revolution was the transition to new manufacturing processes in Europe and the U.S. in the period from about 1760 to sometime between 1820 and 1840. The second industrial revolu revolution is characterized by new technological advances initiated uh, the emergence of a new source of energy well, new sources of energy, electricity, gas, and oil. An approximate date for the start of the second industrial revolution is the mid to late 19th century or approximately 1870. As a result, the development of the internal combustion engine made it possible to use these new resources to their full potential. Furthermore, the steel industry began to develop and grow alongside the exponential demands for steel. Chemical systems also developed to bring up synthetic fabrics. Don't forget dyes and fertilizer. Can you say the petrochemical industry? The second industrial revolution was made possible with the use of fossil fuels. In approximately 1969, a third industrial revolution appeared with the emergence of a new type of energy whose potential surpassed its predecessors, nuclear energy. This revolution witnessed the rise of electronics with the transistor and microprocessor but also the rise of telecommunications and computers. But in 2018, the global system was still almost 85% dependent on fossil fuels where renewables, including solar, wind, geothermal, and biofuels, accounted for just 4% of energy generation. Uh, then he breaks all that down. Uh, good Lord, guys. Uh, you could spend a year, you could teach an entire university course. But anyway, one more paragraph, and then you can pick it up for here. We're 11 pages in to 500 pages. We're going to wrap it up with this, uh, the last, uh, the last uh, paragraph in chapter one here. Current industrialization 
has a foundation in the continuous supply of natural resources. The methods and processes associated with this foundation has significant momentum. Do you think so? This will not be undone easily. Currently, our industrial systems are absolutely dependent on non-renewable natural resources for energy sources, oil, gas, and coal. It is probable that this will continue to do so for some time. A group of economists explored whether market forces alone would cause a reduction in fossil fuel supply or demand. Yeah, right. Uh, market forces causing a reduction in fossil fuel supply or demand. By studying the history of fossil fuel exploration and technological progress for both clean and dirty technologies, they concluded that it is unlikely that the world will stop primarily relying on fossil fuels anytime soon. Do you think so, Simon? But anyway, uh, you can take it from there. I will put the link to this 510 page uh, explanation and he breaks it down into, good Lord, about a hundred chapters. Uh, anybody uh, still not understanding why global industrial civilization has to crash and fossil fuels are not going anywhere, uh, ain't gonna happen. Uh, until it happens. And when it happens, it ain't going to be voluntary. And uh, do your own math. But anyway, if you enjoyed what Simon had to tell you in this short introduction, please take a few minutes to thumb uh, Simon's report up. If you did not enjoy what Simon had to tell you, Please take a few seconds to thumb it down, perhaps. And by all means, come over here and uh, subscribe to Collapse Chronicles. But I have to uh, wrap up today's Collapse Chronicle because I'm getting to spend my very first night tonight. Uh, we're going to break in my new trailer. Uh, my new trailer to survive the collapse. So the little dog and I are heading to bed in the new trailer. And I suggest you get out there and enjoy your new trailer while you still can from your headless horseman. Bye guys.